So thanks everyone for coming. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, bats and apes, but really this, what I want to talk about is a failure to create a constructionist learning game. And I'll talk all about what I mean by that. Some of you know a little bit of this punchline. Um, I direct the Tangible Interaction Design and Learning Lab here at Northwestern University, and that's sort of a, a lab that kind of crosses in between uh, computer science and learning sciences, and a couple of st my students are in the audience, Anna's there, and Mike's back there, so thanks for coming, guys. Okay, so <clears throat> this work is part of an NSF project called Life on Earth, um, and it's a collaboration with a bunch of people at Harvard, University of Nebraska, University of Michigan, um, and Northwestern, and the goal of the project is to create museum exhibits that help people, help visitors learn about evolution. Um, and to do that, we're using multi-touch tabletop technology or interactive tabletop. So um, as lots of visitors like to say, oh, it's like a giant iPad. Um, and that's sort of what tabletops are. They're just sort of tabletop surfaces that you can touch and interact with. We're working with a few museums around the country, including the Field Museum here in Chicago, the Boston Children's Museum and the California Academy of Sciences um, in Golden Gate Park. Um, so it's really exciting to have uh, these partner institutions. Okay, so before I get into what the design is all about, I want to give a little bit of background on the context. Um, so when you're designing for museums, the first thing you have to kind of keep in mind is that you're designing for a free choice learning environment, which means that, um, well, you know what it means. You go into a museum and you have complete freedom to do or not do whatever you want. If you want to try an exhibit, you can try the exhibit. If you don't want to try the exhibit, you don't try the exhibit. If you're bored, you, do, you just leave. And so designing for that environment, you kind of have to keep in mind that whatever you build, people have to sort of want to use it. They have to be interested in sort of understanding what's going on or otherwise it just won't work. Um, second thing is, and we all know this as well, people visit museums in social groups. So when you go to the museum, you go with your friends, you go with your family, you go as part of a school field trip. Um, I mean, people do come to places like natural history museums alone, but it's, it's more the exception than the rule. And in fact, research has sort of found that social interaction is one way that visitors can kind of form meaning around the experiences that they're having at the museum. And then finally, working in natural history museums is a little interesting because natural history museums have very much of a dual role. Um, on the one hand, they typically host real biologists and scientists who go out and do field work for part of the year. Um, so the field museum has a huge staff of biologists who do all sorts of research on all sorts of different things. They also are collections-based institutions. So the field museum has something like 200 million specimens, uh, of biological specimens that are in this massive underground complex below kind of underneath Soldier Field that no one ever sees. Um, um, and then on the other hand, so they've got this sort of scientific mission and then on the other hand they have this public mission which is to sort of educate the public about biology, evolution, natural history and um, <coughs> so they, they're they're using their collections, this sort of rich, authentic artifacts that they have to try to accomplish that mission. Um, and so uh, what you get at a lot of natural history museums, and the one where we did, I, the research I'm going to talk about today was done at the Harvard Museum of Natural History, um, predominantly they're, what the public sees are mounted specimens behind glass, which means essentially dead animals that are either stuffed or pickled and, and put on display for people to sort of appreciate. And, and you know, and I, which isn't to say that it's not amazing. So you know, the, the Harvard Museum has this wall-sized chronosaur, which is this huge underwater dinosaur that just literally takes up you know, this side of the room. And it's an amazing artifact. It's a, the most complete fossil skeleton of this particular type of dinosaur. Um, in the world. So there's certainly value in this, um, but it's sort of an interesting place to put an interactive kind of tabletop exhibit into. Okay, 
So I want to talk a little bit also about this idea of design failure. So when I use failure, I mean it in a very positive way. Um, I want to say that all design is a failure in some way. Okay, no design is ever perfect. And if we sort of reconcile ourselves to that and sort of look and understand the failures and understand how we can make things better, that's where we want to be. Um, so yes, I'm going to present a failure today. Um, and I'll sort of explain why I think it's a failure and how I think it could get better. But it's sort of one step in, an, in, a, in a process. Um, and I'm calling this a constructionist learning game. I'm not sure that's actually even something you can create. I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by that. Um, I'm very much influenced by a grad student at, in the learning sciences, Nathan Holbert, um, who sort of has this idea about games and learning. And he would say that you should actually never say learning game together, that, that you just have games. And all games are learning games, that you, you're, you're playing a game to learn. So I mean learning game in the sense that I'm trying to accomplish some educational objectives, but we can get into that. So before I get into any of the details of the learning objectives or the evaluations, we need to play the game. Um, so we'll do a quick demo, and then, and then hopefully so a lot of people have seen this demo already, but um, as we play the game, try to think about why or why not it's successful. Um, and we can do it that way. Um, I thought about this a little bit, and I don't, I could just demo it for you, but I don't think that that would be any fun, and you wouldn't get the point. So what I need is a volunteer to play the game for me. OK. And now, you have to sort of pretend that you're at the museum you're like the annoying brothers or sisters, which means that you, you can sort of offer solicited or unsolicited advice on how what's your Nathan. Name? Nathan plays the game. OK? <laughs> so go ahead, Nathan. <coughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, you have to imagine that this is on a tabletop that is not in a browser. I will do one, one more level. Okay, so these were the intro levels. This gets harder. Um, we won't do the levels. This is 
Yeah, especially harder if you. Can. All right. I don't know why it's not working. Oh, internet is down. Anyway, <laughs> it gets harder. The levels are sort of designed to build on one another. Um, so you'll be able, you, the idea is that you can try to start to remember relationships that you play in previous levels. Um, our original version of the game had eight levels and the eighth level was the bonus level and it had nine organisms that you were trying to build into a tree. Um, and so if anyone knows like a little combinatorics, there are well over two million ways to construct a tree with nine organisms. Um, and so when we had this in the museum, visitors were getting really frustrated. We made this little girl cry and it was just like, <laughs> it was no good. So <clears throat> we went down to six levels and that's kind of where we, we settled things. Okay, so I hope that in playing the game, you're keeping a little mental checklist, a little bug list of things that you liked about the game things that you didn't like about the game, things that were confusing, ways that you thought it could be better, and we'll, we'll kind of go back to that. Anybody have any questions at this, before we go on? In the nine level version, were they relying on memory of previous failures, so it was kind of like a game of go fish? Yes. Um, so I don't know if it was exactly like go Fish, but yeah, it was sort of like. It's a card game where no, <laughs> I know go fish, but I'm. <laughs> yeah, I mean you're trying to use yes in a way that you're trying to use your memory of the the last this set of relationships that you you've done before to try to sketch, and you've seen all the relationships before. The problem is that there's lots of different ways that you can assemble the trees in, in order. Um, so you have to join these two first, and then these two, and then you can put those two subtrees together before you can attach on the, you know, the, the invertebrates. And so. And could you just as easily split it apart at the desired places? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can pull apart. Um, <coughs> and y you can also get like little information down here about the organisms. No one ever used this information, but it was there to try to like help with understanding. Okay, so that's the game. Um, let's go back to the PowerPoint. I want to talk a little bit about some of the, the, the backgrounds, related work and background, and then I'll, I'll move into the evaluation that we did at the, the Harvard Museum. So, um, I don't know, have, has anyone actually seen an interactive tabletop at a museum? Sort of in use? A few people? Yeah. There's, there's a few around Chicago, you can find them. Um, and I, I sort of have, you know, seen a lot of different interactive tabletops around at different museums around the country. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of reason why people are interested in this technology. You know, it seems like it's a nice walk up and use technology. You can imagine that a social group would kind of gather around the tabletop to share in an activity. Um, it has this kind of appealing multimedia aspect to it. Um, but uh, I, in sort of looking at different tabletop exhibits, have been sort of consistently underwhelmed um, by the exhibits that I've seen. Like, I just don't feel like they're living up to, to expectations. And some of the reasons are um, shallow engagement. So you walk up, like there's some photos that you can kind of move around. Maybe you can read some text, but you're not really deeply engaging with any of the content on the table. Um, poor support for collaboration. And by that I mean that people have a hard time sort of coming to a consensus on a shared goal and then figuring out a way to sort of work together to achieve that goal. Interactions that interfere with other visitors. So imagine that you know, you're looking at a piece of text on the table and your little brother has a, you know, a picture of a scorpion that he expands out to fill the entire table, right? And then suddenly that text you're reading is covered by the scorpion. Um, another example is that if there's a button, so just a graphical button that you can press on the table. So I might be looking at something, 
somebody else presses a button and suddenly the screen changes. And I, because I was focused on this particular part of the table, didn't realize that the screen changed and I don't understand what's going on and suddenly everything is gone. Um, despite the fact that these tables, you know, despite the fact that we live in the iPod, iPad age, people still have difficulty learning and understanding how to use tabletop technology and multi-touch technology. Um, and that's especially true for certain demographics of our visitor population. There's technical limitations, and the technical limitations are kind of going away. These involve like how we project images, um, how the sensing technology works. These are going away as the technology gets better. And then just good old fashioned bad usability. Um, and that I think sort of comes out of a lot of these exhibits were developed on tight budgets and tight time scales. And so just don't have a chance to put something in the field and watch it and iterate on the design to try to improve it. There are some exceptions. So a couple of exceptions that I like, um, Alyssa Antle at the University of Simon Fraser has a, an exhibit that her team put together called Futura that was at the 2010 Winter Olympics. Um, and that was in many ways an inspiration for the game that you guys just played. Um, another one called Rain Table was developed at UIC here in Chicago. Um, and I really like this one because what it is is it's a topographical map of Mount Rainier and there are tokens on the table and you can place a token and the token is a rain cloud and when you place a token water starts to pour down imagine that it's raining and the water sort of follows the curves of the mountain and forms into rivers and and other people can place tokens to cause rain at different locations on the mountain and I like this exhibit because it's it's beautiful it's simple but it has complexity um, and that there's just an infinite number of ways that you can position rain clouds to make rain um, and watch different formations on the mountain. It's also socially scalable, which is a term I'm borrowing from Scott Snivy, who designs um, shadow exhibits. You guys know what shadow exhibits are, right? Like projector, they're shadows, you know, you're pushing bubbles around on the screen. Go, go to the Museum of Science and Industry and they have some better. <laughs> <coughs> But socially scalable means two things. It means first that the exhibit, if it, you know, multiple people can stand around the exhibit, multiple people can also interact at the same time. But it also means that the experience becomes richer as you have more people involved. Okay, so that's kind of this meaning of social scalability. And that this, so this is a really nice example of, a, of what I think is a, a successful tabletop exhibit. So a bunch of studies have started looking at learning and collaboration with tabletops in, in more formal settings like classrooms um, and offices. Um, and there's some preliminary evidence that tabletops can be you know, effective in facilitating learning. Uh, but we can't really assume that success in a formal learning environment like a classroom is necessarily going to translate to a context like a museum. There's also been a, a, sort of an increasing amount of literature looking at tabletops in the wild, just sort of naturalistic settings. And that research is nice. It mostly focuses on what people do with tabletops or like what gestures they use and how they walk up to the table, how they leave the table, and less on sort of is the design itself successful. Okay, so to help determine whether or not the Build-A-Tree game was successful. I'm borrowing a concept from the um, <coughs> science museum literature called Active Prolonged Engagement, and this is from the San Francisco Exploratorium. Um, and the idea with Active Prolonged Engagement is that it, it describes a certain type of exhibit where people spend a long time at the exhibit and they're sort of focused and engaged together as a social group with the activity. Um, and I won't read this out, but one of the key parts of an active prolonged engagement exhibit, or APE is the sort of shorthand, is that the, um, the shift of the role of the visitor from that of the recipient of instruction and explanations to visitors who participate with the museum and other visitors 
and the generation of activities, questions, and explanations. The idea is that we're sort of no longer propping up the museum as the authority that knows the answers and sort of giving the authority to the visitors so that the visitors are there to co-construct meaning and understanding. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, so that's APE. Now, the learning goals for the, the game that you just played, our, our broad learning goals are about evolution and common descent. The idea that all life on Earth is related so that if you go back far enough in time, um, you can find, so take any two organisms, if you go back far enough in time, you can find a common ancestor. So we can take Ed Colgate and a banana, and if you go back far enough in time, you will find a common ancestor of Ed Colgate and a banana, some sort of <laughs> proto-eukaryote, probably in a puddle somewhere. Um, and in practice, scientists sort of understand these evolutionary relationships by looking at shared derived character traits that, that organisms have. Um, and the way they talk about that, or the way they discuss hypotheses about how organisms are related is something called a phylogenetic tree, uh, which is what we were building. And a phylogenetic tree is sort of a branching structure that shows relationships of organisms. So in this tree, it's saying that cave spiders and black widow spiders are closely related, and they, they share this sort of derived inherited trait called tangle web, whatever that means. And that over here we have orb weavers and orchid spiders that have a modified spigot. And that these groups sort of recursively are a clade, is, is the term, that are defined by the, the presence of an orb web. Okay? And you see these all the time in natural history museums. And um, a bunch of people have argued that it's really important to understand, for the general public to understand phylogenetic trees. Uh, as they're sort of core to modern biology and sort of essential to understanding evolution and how evolution works. Um, and they sort of have this sort of set of skills that they call tree thinking skills, which more or less boil down to the ability to read and interpret phylogenetic trees co correctly. Um, and sort of the, the goal of the game that you guys played was to try to get some of these tree thinking skills across to the, to the visitors. Okay, so that brings us to, now imagine that you had never seen the game, right? So I'm thinking, the, our team was working on how do we engage visitors with phylogenetic trees, okay? That, that was kind of our design goal. And remember, they have to want to engage, the, you know, we're not forcing them to use this tabletop exhibit, like they need to, they sort of have to be motivated to sit there and do something. Um, and I also wanted them to build their own phylogenetic trees. Um, and th this is, was sort of inspired by a PhD student at, in the learning sciences who, who graduated and gone Camellia, Camellia <laughs> project, um, who sort of built a flash game where you could go through certain steps to build your own phylogenetic trees. Um, and this is where I call this a constructionist learning game. The constructionism is a, a term originally sort of invented by Seymour Papert, which the idea is that, the theory is that learning is best when you're creating artifacts, tangible artifacts in the real world that are personally meaningful, okay? So in Seymour Papert's case, it was logo, and that was sort of the quintessential constructionist learning environment where you're creating logo programs as a way of learning about all sorts of different things. So anyway, back to the design dilemma here. The question is, how do you get visitors to want to build phylogenetic trees? Um, and the only answer that we came up with so far is that you embed them in this sort of game structure. So you make it a game, you have these multiple levels with puzzles on each level, and Hopefully that gets visitors interested in creating their own trees. Um, so in doing this, there were a couple of constraints. I wanted to have a real game, okay? I didn't want to have an exhibit that had the trappings of a game, that sort of advertised itself as a game, that like, but wasn't really a game. 
So you see this a lot that um, interactive surfaces will use physics engines or they'll have a little inertia so you can kind of slide a photograph across the table. So to me, when you have that, the table itself is sort of advertising itself as a game. It's using language and sort of the affordances of gameplay. Um, and then when visitors come and they discover, hey, this isn't a game, my hypothesis is that they're actually kind of pissed off. Um, they may not even realize that they're pissed off, but somehow you violated this implicit contract. You've advertised yourself as a game, and then you turn out to be some sort of other activity. And then when that happens, and this is all hypothetical, but when that happens, visitors find ways to subvert your intended sort of objective for the activity, and they turn it into a game. So you see this when you know, you're supposed to be looking at photos and text, and what people are actually doing is playing air hockey. Right, so they're just tossing photos around. Like, so they figure out a way to make this thing into a game because, gosh darn it, you know, that's what it's supposed to be. Or they just get a you know, sort of lead. So one thing was to make sure it was really a game. And the other part of that was this concept called intrinsic integration. Okay? So intrinsic integration was originally proposed by Yasmin Kafai in, in, the, in the 90s um, and was kind of picked up recently by a couple of people uh, Sharon Edgeworth and, and I don't know, I think, what is it? Jacob, Jacob yeah, okay. Um, and it has sort of two fundamental principles. First, you deliver the learning material through the parts of the game that are most fun to play. Okay, and so why I like this, this part is that implicit in this principle is the idea that your game is actually fun. Um, and not only that, the fun parts are the the parts where you're, you're learning something. Rather than sort of making, you know, you, you know, the sort of the math blast, this is the anti-math blaster. So it has, I don't know if people have played math blaster, but the idea is that you have to solve all of these sort of arithmetic problems before you can shoot asteroids or something like that, right? And so it's like you get rewarded extrinsically for doing the, the boring math work then you get to play. The second principle is that games provide external representations of learning content that is explored through the core mechanisms of gameplay. So what this is saying is that the game, and, and you know, in my case it's a, it's a phylogenetic tree, but the game has some representation of the learning content that you're supposed to get at. And that by manipulating that representation, you're not only playing the game, but you're learning at the same time. And so in the ideal world, the, the learning and the mechanics of the gameplay are as close as possible, if not the same thing. Which I hope makes some sense. Okay, so I want to talk briefly about the evaluation we did. We, um, we put this, the game in, uh, Zena was there. Zena and I had the game at uh, the Harvard Museum of Natural History. And we spent a week at the museum in the, in the hall of vertebrate paleontology with sort of dinosaur fossils all around us. Um, and there's an interactive tabletop. Uh, we recruited 35 families for video recording. Um, and this consisted of, uh, let's see, how many people? 84 people, okay? Um, and we, we essentially said, we'd like you to try our game. Use this exhibit like you would any other exhibit in the, in the museum and stay for as little or as long as you like. If you get bored, you can leave. And then Zane and I walked across the room and sat down and we just watched, okay? And we had a video camera going. And then we also observed an additional 49 social groups where we didn't interact with them in any way at all. So we just sat in the corner and watched people and how they used the exhibit, okay? So for the people that we video recorded, we then transcribed six levels of gameplay and developed a, an iterative coding scheme to try to understand what they, were, what they were talking about and what they were doing with the table. And th this is the, the coding scheme that we came up with. I'll come back to this later, but it basically has three parts. It has game talk, which is any talk that visitors are engaging in about playing the game. Content talk, which is sort of evolution tree content talk, and then off topic talk. Okay. So remember, we had active prolonged engagement, or APE. 
And so I'm using, in the ape studies, they have a set of benchmarks that they sort of say, this is what we mean by an ape exhibit. And there was actually quantitative data behind those benchmarks so that I could set up our game and compare it to this sort of ape gold standard, okay? Um, and so the, the we, we looked at a, a bunch of metrics. I think the two that are most interesting is off-topic talk and holding time. Um, so I'll show you those. So off-topic talk for the people that we video recorded was something like 1.2% of the overall conversation. Okay, so there were approximately 0.16 off-topic utterances per minute, okay? Uh, which was very surprising. Uh, people, there were just very few off-topic comments. And these are things like, look, mommy, there's a camera, you know, or I need to go to the bathroom. So that's kind of an off-topic talk, anything that wasn't directly about the exhibit. Um, so we felt that this was a very strong indication that people were focused on the activity, okay? And then the other thing we looked at is holding time. And this is a common metric in museum evaluations. Um, and what it means is basically how long are people staying at the table? How long are they engaging? Um, so of the people that we video recorded, so I should preface this. In the APE studies, 3.3 minutes was indicative of an active prolonged engagement. That's an average holding time, okay? And you have to remember that includes things where people walk up to the table, they touch it, and then they walk away, okay? Um, and it also includes people who just stay there for 25 minutes. Um, so they found that 3.3 minutes was, was three times higher than most of their other exhibits in terms of holding time. So for the people that we video recorded, our average holding time was 14 minutes, um, which is crazy. And what we had to do was we had to kick people off after 15 minutes because there were people in line. And, and people are really into playing this game. The, this is people that we video recorded, so we didn't trust these numbers at all because you know we're asking you to participate in the study. Um, you sign the consent form. There's a video camera. We're standing over there at the side of this. So, so that's why we, we watched another set of visitors. Um, and so this is, this is the number that I trust a little bit more. This is sort of just watching anyone who walked through how long that they interacted with the exhibit on average. Um, and our average was 3.5 um, minutes on average, which is right around the active prolonged engagement holding time. Um, and you can kind of see the distribution. We had people staying for 18, 19, 21 minutes. But mostly, you have people kind of staying around three to four minutes. The other thing we saw was that people, you, people were able to work effectively as groups. And I say effectively, you know, we observed, you know, like we saw two brothers interacting with the exhibit and they were both working on the thing and they got into a fight over whose turn it was and they started punching each other. Um, I call that effective because, <laughs> So you can sort of see how much you trust me. Um, but that was effective for me because they stayed with the activity. Yeah, they were physically, like they had to result to a sort of physical violence, but they weren't leaving. They weren't walking away. They were like, they were determined to figure out the game. Um, that was kind of the extreme case. But you know, we saw things where you had like three or four girls playing the game for a long time, working together and sort of figuring out a way to take turns and share in the, in the, in the play of the game. Um, so it seems our, our game, Build a Tree Bat, was pretty ape-like um, in terms of how, like, the focus level and the engagement time. But the question is sort of why are visitors engagement, uh, engaged? And our game was very different from the ape activities at the Exploratorium, and I'll get to that in a minute. But um, I think it goes back to the idea that this is a game. And I'm gonna say a little bit more about that. Um, 
a lot of research on games for learning has kind of focused on why is it that games are great environments for learning. So what is it about the design of video games in particular that makes them good for learning? Um, a sort of alternative perspective um, is why is it that children are such good learners? And this is where I'm kind of going. So this, this is ethnographic work done by Stephen Satwick and McCarthy. Um, and what they did is they went into a bunch of people's houses and they video recorded children playing video games. And they also sort of video, they had like a dual channel video where they saw what was on the screen and they saw what the kids were doing. And what they found was kids were incredibly inventive in terms of how they organized themselves in different sorts of structures to learn and play video games. Um, and they saw all sorts of different mentoring relationships, sort of roughly equal peer relationships, kids moving between inner and outer circles of gameplay, um, and really doing very sophisticated types of tasks on their own without any adult intervention, okay? So the takeaway for me on this research is that kids really know, when it comes to gameplay, they know how to organize themselves effectively to play games. Um, and guess what? It's not all that surprising that they're able to take what they know about playing games from one context, like their homes, and apply those same sort of social practices in the museum context. Kids walk up to a game, they know it's a video game, they know what to do. Um, and you can kind of see that reflected in our coding. When we had these, these categories of talk, this is game talk. Roughly 50% of all of the visitor utterances were what we call game talk, which is a, about the gameplay, and I'm gonna sort of break this down. Um, some of it was content talk, 25%, that's not too bad. So that's actually where they're talking about the organisms and how they're related and why they might be related. Um, and then here's, here's the off-topic talk. So game talk included things like turn-taking, which is sort of negotiating both sort of how shared participation in the game, sort of negotiating who gets to stand where. Can I stand in the center next time? Let me stand in the center now. Can I stand in the middle now? Come on, let me stand in the middle. And, you know, and then they move into the middle. Um, or my turn next. Okay, it's my turn. Or no, it's not your turn. I'm doing this level. You know, that kind of talk. And you guys all know what this talk is like, right? You, you know what this is. And people, but, and they spent a lot of time doing this, especially when they were kids, uh, playing by themselves without an adult. And sort of our argument is that this talk was actually really valuable in sort of maintaining the social negotiation and the social aspects of the, of the uh, engagement. There was narration. This is sort of like play by play what's going on in the game right now. So they're just sort of verbalizing what they're doing. Um, coaching, which was all sorts of things, but it you know, could be encouragement like, yay guys, we, we got another star or no, you should put that one over there. I think that's the way it goes. You know, sort of trying to help each other out. Um, pacing talk, which was kind of like, wait, wait, I want to see what's going on. Um, parents use pacing talk a lot to sort of tell kids to stop and think. Um, you know, when you get to the, you know, there was like the text in the game, like, did you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, kids, of course, like, it's just like, bam, bam, bam. Like, let's go through that and like play the game some more. Uh, but parents would say, stop, you got to read, you know, the text, so that, that kind of talk. And then reflection talk was less common, but it would be things like, oh, I think the game is getting harder now. I think we're getting better at the game, that kind of talk. <clears throat> okay. So I'm going to bring this around to back to design failure. So why do I think that this was a failure? I'm, well, I'm curious what you think. Why was this a failure? Maybe I said too high standards. People were clearly engaged, okay? Um, how did you feel playing the game? I'm gonna make you talk. Somebody's gonna have to say something. Okay, I, I didn't play it, obviously this is my first look at it, but um, I don't know, about, I was kind of curious as to the response of how much learning was actually going on as opposed to figuring out 
just the mechanics of the game. So much of it seemed very mechanics-based rather than what, what exactly what you were getting at was educating them about the tree. And so the, the, end, the end sense of achievement uh, in, in terms of learning objectives didn't seem to be there. Yeah, and I, and I think that that, that was the, one of the, the biggest things that when we broke out the learning, the content talk, it seemed like really what was going on was a lot of trial and error. Yeah. And there wasn't a lot of reasoning about why is it that these two things go together or these other two things don't go together, that, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, people are engaged, but if it's just sort of like engaged playing a game that's mostly trial and error, are they really learning anything about tree thinking? Um, so that was one area where I felt like it was a little bit of a failure. Any other? Like when we figured out the question mark, yeah, and the question mark showed us what attributes those things and that, or what attributes that organism had. Yeah, then we figured out that those are the things that we potentially be matching in that situation. And if we had those attributes ahead of time, like some sort of like prompting when that level began, like here are some of the attributes you might need to use to make a tree here. I would know in advance to look for those attributes in those animals. Yeah, so that that's kind of like a, a setup or like how, how it might get better, and I, I, I totally agree with that. Um, Arthur? I think, I mean, I, I, you know, it's your first point, but I thought it was kind of like reverse engineering a recipe. It, we were constructing something, but there was only one correct way of constructing it, which made it less interesting. Yeah. Um, and there was like the, the phrase. Right. So this, this is the main thing for me, that if you go back to the, the sort of description of what ape is, it's all about taking authority away from the museum and giving it to the visitors, letting the visitors co-construct knowledge, right? And yet, what are we doing? We're saying, here's the scientist tree, and you either get the answer right or wrong, and if you get it right, you get some stars, right? Um, we've totally... Yeah, they're engaged, but we've totally taken the authority back and sort of solidified it in the hands of the museum, right? And the scientists, whoever they are, right? Like, they, they sort of own correct knowledge in a way. Um, and this goes back to constructionism, and this is why I feel like it's a failed constructionist learning game. In constructionism, you're building tangible artifacts in the real world, but the idea is that these are personally meaningful, that I want to build that thing. So has anybody played Minecraft? We've got a couple of Minecraft enthusiasts. This is like a quintessential constructionist game, right? Like, yeah, there are zombies that come out in the middle of the night, but really, like, the zombies have nothing to do with it. Like, it's about building stuff. It's like this incredibly interesting and compelling building environment where you can create whatever you want. Starship Enterprise, you can create it. Little Big Planet is another example. Um, and so, yeah, they're building trees, but I don't think that they're personally meaningful trees in any, any sense of the word. So, oh, and the last point is that it gives this impression that science is fixed, that you know we sort of know the answers and that's it. And in reality, phylogenetic trees are hypotheses that are actively debated all over the place. We have really very little idea about how most organisms are related in actuality. Even when we have genetic evidence, the scientists are making like all sorts of decisions about how to interpret that evidence that affect the resulting trees. And you can go back and forth saying, I want to use this algorithm, I want to use that algorithm, we should be looking at these specific genetic markers versus these other specific genetic markers. And guess what, if you switch them out, you get a different answer. So science is not at all decided or fixed, um, and yet we're representing science as being fixed. Okay. So um, how do we fix this? Um, we really like the fact that people are engaged, and we like the fact that it's a game, we like the fact that they know how to sort of interact socially around this. So one thought is that we let visitors play two or three levels just like you did, and then we throw in a kind of curveball level. And so we throw in a level where the idea is, guess what? Scientists don't know the answer to this one. Um, here are three or four organisms. How do you think they're related? 
and we give them a set of traits to work with, we give them the organisms, and we let them discuss and come up with their representation. Um, and so the idea is that you, by giving them three or four levels to play, you sort of have cued them in, this is how you interact with this e exhibit, this is what it's about, this is how you play, so they know what they're doing, and by the time they get to this level, they're engaged and sort of they want to play the game and finish all the levels. So they're ready to go, and then you can give them something that's sort of a, a little bit of an open-ended curveball. And so the hypothesis there is that you'll ideally get really interesting discussion where they start to think about the relationships and what the relationships mean. So that's, that's the next phase of this research is to see if we start to make these and a bunch of other changes that we want to make, but that's the core one to see if that changes what visitors are talking about. Yeah. I, mean, I, just, I don't know how much you thought about this, but how would you get to a closure there? Any other levels? I get a star and someone says, well, that's been, I, you know, I, I feel like I'm thinking something. How, I mean, how, how would that happen? Publication in evolution science. <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's good. You might not get closure. And, you know, frankly, that might be okay. Um, walking away saying, it's really unsettling that scientists don't know this. It might be, might be an actual learning outcome in and of itself. Um, just curious, was your target like, I guess, demographic or like um, I mean, when you're designing for museums, you really are, tr it's like a universal design undertaking. You're really trying to design for everyone. Um, that being said, kids seem to be, <laughs> uh, for a lot of reasons, the, the most in, engaged by this. We get a lot of comments just watching. You'll see adults come through and they see the table. They don't even know what's on the table and they'll say something like, oh, we're not here to play games. Um, that's not what we're here to do. We're here to look at these artifacts. Um, and, you know, in the holding time data that you saw, the, ad the adult only groups were by far the lowest. You know, they would play maybe one or two levels and then sort of walk away. So we're trying to design for everyone, but I think in reality we're designing for kids, you know, pro from seven or eight to like 13 or so. Um, and then also parents and chi children together, uh, like working side by side is another big up. So given that, is, have you had any, I guess, observed any problems in getting kids to even understand the college and Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't know, I mean, if you don't know what phylogeny is or like what we mean by relationships or what we mean by trees, like you can figure it out, but it's totally bewildering. Um, and so we're, we're, we're thinking about, okay, how do we, and in the museum space, you sort of take visitors where they come and you try to move them along a little bit. You know, this is not a very long period of time to interact. Um, but we're trying to figure out a way to make make those notions, relationship, trees, traits a little bit clearer to people. Right. So I'm in developing this game that you learn the rules of the first three stages and you sort of take rules and create your own object. Um, what, what group are you aiming for in terms of the people who stay? Because if your average is 3.3 three minutes, then that's a that's quick tutorial. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not interested. Uh, well, y and you have to remember, like 3.3 .3 is the average. So a lot of people stay a lot longer than that. So I don't know the answer, honestly. Uh, I think if people played that one open-ended level and they spent like a minute and a half and they really talked about it, um, like they had an honest discussion about what is, what is it that they actually mean by relationships? And even if they don't walk away with the definitive answer, um, that would be kind of a successful outcome for us. Because you're right, it's not, it's just, it's not a very long period of time. Um, and so you're trying to get a meaningful experience sort of encapsulated in the short, short period. Um, and then the other thing is integrating within the museum context. So as I mentioned, like natural history museums are collection-based institutions and they have wonderful collections um, so one idea is that, you know, there, uh, you could find a phylogeny tree 
and a museum and imagine there's a QR code on the phylogeny tree and you can just snap a picture of it and play the game on your iPad or on your iPhone. So this is all implemented in HTML5, so it runs in a browser, it also runs on the table, it also runs on an iPad. So uh, it would be sort of a fairly easy step to create customized games that are tailored for the museums that we're, we're working in. Um, and then, you know, in, in general, the idea is to move from Ape to Apples, where this is uh, Margaret Evans at the University of Michigan coined this term, but moving from active prolonged engagement to active <coughs> prolonged learning is kind of where you want to go. Um, that is 